I always tell the story that my mom would have said that one of the first multi-syllable words I ever said was archaeology. My name is Jan Schimmick. I am now retired, have been for a bit over a year from the Department of Anthropology at the University of Tennessee. I was at UT for 39 years. Over the course of that time, um, I taught archaeology classes and did archaeological research. I also did a bit of um, administration at the university. I always wanted to return to archaeology when I was doing administration because it is and always has been the, the love of my life. In my deep youth, two and three and four years old, looking through pictures of um, Egyptian mummies and figuring that that's what I wanted to do. Over the course of my young life, I um, was very interested in history, ancient history in particular, and I would read from different parts of the world, different histories, and because I did that, I would occasionally change the interest I had in archaeology, where I wanted to do it and what time periods I wanted to work in, but there was never anything else I wanted to do. What really began to interest me in college as I read more deeply into archaeology, was sort of the origins of human cognition and how we came to be the, the intellectual organisms that we are. You can look at that in a whole bunch of different sort of contexts. I got very interested um, in late in my undergraduate education and then in my graduate education in the very earliest archaeological sites in Europe and went on field schools and began to excavate and developed a collegial relationship with folks from the University of Bordeaux in Southern France and spent most of my career, my graduate career in particular, doing Paleolithic archeology span in, in France. I was interested in the transition from Neanderthals to modern humans, which plays out a little bit in the, in the realm of, of cave art, but that's not really what I did. What, what I was interested in is how they use the landscape how they made their living and, and how that differed between Neanderthals and the early modern people that came after them. But it's hard to ignore the fact that, that at that time period in Europe is when the great cave art began to be produced. And so that was always a piece of the equation, although in a lot of ways, not my piece, but I was aware of it. And, and I visited lots and lots of cave art sites. We had to talk about it, obviously, if we were considering the origins of of modern human cognition. And so it became part of what I did. When I came to the University of Tennessee, I was hired as a Paleolithic archeologist. I, I still am a Paleolithic archeologist. I still do work in Europe periodically. The last year or so was has been hard because the Olympics kind of blocked me from, from going over. But I pretty much go over every year and work with my colleagues there and work in museums. The interesting cave art in North America came about in almost accidentally. At a certain point, there there was a cave art site discovered in Tennessee, really the very first cave art site ever discovered in North America. My colleague at the time, Charles Faulkner at the University of Tennessee, was the one who worked on it and published a wonderful book about it. But it became clear that the, these things were there. And a few years later after that, um, a group of students that were doing a, an archaeological survey um, for the Tennessee Valley Authority, found another cave art site. And Faulkner didn't really want to um, analyze a second one because his real expertise was in historical archaeology. So he kind of said, you work in Europe in cave art, you do this. And so almost accidentally, I got involved with cave art here. It's a very interesting topic, obviously, and um, we dove in with um, both feet began to look for more sites. Over time, we began to find lots of sites um, so that there are about a hundred of them now known in the Southeast. And, and that's how I got interested in cave art. So the topic of my, um, my lecture is going to um, be discoveries that we've made in Alabama and elsewhere over the last decade or so of writing on the walls of caves, deep inside of caves, that were made by Cherokee people using a syllabary written language that was invented in Alabama in all likelihood, somewhere in the 1820s, early part of the 19th century, by a, a great Cherokee scholar whose name was Sequoia. And so they, they refer to this Cherokee writing system as the Sequoian syllabary. 
It differs from an alphabet like ours in that we use multiple symbols to create sounds or to reference sounds. A syllabary uses individual symbols to reference the individual symbols in a language. And Sequoia, when he invented his writing system, he used that approach. And he was able to rather elegantly, in fact, create a system that allowed Cherokee people to read and write in their own language um, with a minimum of symbols. You know, obviously this is a direct link to historical Cherokee people. So the tribe that we consult with, that I work with, in fact, collaborate with, are Cherokees. One of the things that became very clear when we began to find this stuff was that we would never be able to make hide nor hair out of it if we didn't work with Cherokee scholars who were language specialists, who were themselves archaeologists um, and historians in order to, to develop a, a rich picture uh, of the, the meaning, the archaeological meaning of these um, inscriptions that we're seeing on the walls. That collaboration is ongoing. Uh, it's resulted in a number of published papers. It's resulted in um, a, a PhD dissertation that's currently nearing completion um, by a Cherokee archaeology scholar. And a, a wonderful collaboration among um, Cherokee scholars and my research group um, that has allowed us to sort of find a richness in the doing of archaeology that we wouldn't have been able to, to, to have if we hadn't undertaken this work in collaboration with them. Americans need to know and understand their own history. The fact of the matter is that all human groups over the course of their history make mistakes. And in order to understand those mistakes and not make them more often uh, than is ultimately useful, we need to understand the history. But it also, I think, uh, to me anyway, it always impresses on me the, the richness and depth of the American experience, the Aboriginal American experience, the colonial American experience, the modern American experience, those things are all intertwined. Together they define who we are as Americans. To ignore them or to ignore parts of them uh, in many ways is, is to censor our own history, censor our own sense of self. And that, that just doesn't make any sense. I think understanding that history, all of it in its richness, but also the, the good parts and the bad parts of it is important for, for us in the present and important for us in the future. Mm -hmm.